Uh, I was really, really worn out and I probably didn't even know it at the time. And I said to Helen and Henry, can I just come and sit because I've been serving forever <laughs> and serving very, very um, faithfully, I suppose is the word. But yeah, with everything within me. And so they said, yeah, come and sit under our tree. And so we've got this little thing going that I just sat under the tree for quite some time. And as you know, I've preached once or twice or three or four times, I don't know, I can't remember. But for me, it was sitting under a tree where I was loved and accepted and valued, whether I gave or didn't give. And I think that's, that speaks volumes. Because sometimes, you know, when pastors come to a church, people want you to just get up and do everything straight away. But they gave me the time to heal and the time to rest and recuperate. And um, it, I really thank you for that. It's been, for me, a real turning point in my life. And um, I always had this, this sort of vision and goal for my, my own life that I wanted to pastor a city, not a church. And so that's when I left um, the church that I was in at the time because I felt like I was pretty well stuck inside the four walls of a church. So I chose to go outside of that. And these guys really understood that. You know, and allowed me to keep my credentials without serving if I didn't want to serve, um, because I was serving the community, and they saw that. And I think that's that speaks volumes to me. It really does. And since that transition for me, I, I just love what I do. It's changed my whole ethic on church and on on ministry and on on giving into the community, because I can actually pastor a city without having to have a credential even. <laughs> So um, thank you, and I honour you and love you guys and look forward to this preach today. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Who ever gave me this job? I don't know. I was like fine all week. I've just been like semi-detached, you know, like when you're detached from your emotions. That's how I've got through this week, not thinking about it. Um, it's been like that for a few weeks, actually. And then this morning, just seeing the guys up here, um, you know, having Jess and Wayne here. Yeah, it's all just a bit real now, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, I need that help. My eyes are a bit leaky. <laughs> oh, praise God. All right, what am I doing here? I'm going to hopefully try and stay on track. And look, it's like, what do you say? Like, this is the last message that I'll speak, you know, here. And maybe, who knows, maybe the last time I'll, I'll ever get to preach. Um, so what do you say? Like, what do you say for your final, your final message, you know? Um, no pressure, all right. And I did have a lot of pressure. I was like, but I was just trying to not think about it all week. Thanks. Thanks, Nosh. <laughs> um, and so I had no real sense of what I was going to say, um, which is pretty scary when you've got to stand up here. Um, so I just thought the best that I can come up with is just to leave you with some final thoughts. Um, Final thoughts from Pastor Helen, okay? Maybe you'll remember that in your brain. Um, when, and I'm sure you will. And um, yeah, so thank you, Lord. <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your people. Thank you for, um, Lord, all that you've done, all that you will do. Uh, we thank you for just... Yeah, just those opportunities that we've had over the years as family. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. That's it. All right. So final thoughts from Pastor Helen um, on living, loving and leading well and just generally being a follower of Jesus. Um, and, you know, like these, this collection of ramblings... Um, 
is really things that I've, conclusions that I've reached over the years of being in ministry for a long, 30, over 30 years um, and starting this church in our lounge room almost 19 years ago with some people that are here today, which is pretty great. Um, and just, you know, seeing, having the opportunity to see, you know, people have kids, we marry people, have kids, raise their kids, be part of the church. I think one of the things that like really tipped me over the edge a few weeks ago is when I heard that Landon, uh, or like, as Zion said, will I still see Landon? Oh, I was like, oh my gosh. Okay, that's two little kids, my grandson and Josh and Beck's son. Um, I'm sure they'll see each other, so it's all good, right? Everybody's good. And that's great, Mum Kay, if you can... You know, you've got that heart to want to connect and keep people connected. That's wonderful. It's really good. So anyway, some final thoughts from me. The first thing that I sort of was thinking about um, was, you know, we hear a lot. We hear a lot about the gospel, you know, like in church. You've got to preach the gospel. You know, it's all about the gospel. Well, you know, what is the gospel? And if I asked you to sort of summarise what is the gospel in a, in a couple of sentences, I'm sure we'd get some really varied sort of ideas around what is the gospel well the gospel is good news right gospel is another you know term for good news so the gospel is good news and when we're talking about the gospel of jesus christ it's the divine announcement that you are loved and that you are ex accepted exactly as you are in the gospel, like the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is no fear, there's no guilt, there's no shame, and there's no condemnation. Amen. There's no manipulation. There's no lists of things that, of what you have to do to earn what you already have. Amen. Remember this, guys. Like, remember this. As we go forward, let's remember this. When we, when we maybe find ourselves in a different, a different space, a different environment, remember that there's no shame in the gospel, that there's no guilt, no condemnation, okay? For those that are in Christ and you're in Christ, amen? So we remember that. The gospel um, is not information about how to avoid hell, okay? Because... Really, that's the primary, sadly, in a way, and we've been there, done that. Sadly, that, fear, you know, that persuasion against going to hell has been largely the way the gospel has been presented. And fear and guilt and shame is never a great motivator, okay? Um, it leads to just sort of distorted thinking. But the gospel is good news of great joy for all people, that there is a better way to live and a better path to walk. That is the gospel. It's about life now. Yeah. It's not we, like we've seemed to fixate it on what happens in eternity, but the gospel is about now. It's good news for living now. Right. Amen. So remember that. Remember that. And the other thing that I, like another thought that I had is about our faith. Our, our faith is never intended to be a destination yeah. or a status. You know, God is not distant. He's not a distant destination that I somehow have to reach. Okay, God is not out there. Okay, there's a song from the 80s, you know, what if God was one of us, a slob, just like one of us. And like, I used to listen to that, you know, and be so offended by those words, you know, like. Um, but you know what? What if God is just like one of us, you know, and he is. He, he's, he's present to us. And, and, and better still, he, 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 he you know, for, for generations and generations, people tried to work out what God was like, you know, like if God was happy and pleased, they had abundance of crops. If, if God was mad at them and punishing them, you know, there was floods and famine and all, and, you know, all through since the beginning of time, you know, people, humanity, humanity has been trying to work out what God is like. And, you know, like when you read the scriptures, like you can see that there's just this, some crazy thoughts about what God is like. 
he's a punisher, he's, you know, you know, he's into divine justice, you know, meaning that, you know, his wrath and anger is just kindled against humanity and all of that. And you can find those things in the scriptures, but we know that, you know, basically in the end, God said, look, you just cannot work it out, so I've got to come, I've got to send, I've got to come and reveal myself. And, and Jesus came and he revealed what God was like and he said, you know, like, if you've seen me, well, we haven't physically seen him, but we've seen him with our heart. And it says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if we want to know what God is like, he's not a deadbeat dad. He's not, you know, absent father. He's not genie in a bottle. He's Jesus. He's like Jesus, exactly like Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He came to heal the sick. He came to recover sight to those who are blind. He came to preach a better way. He came preaching good news, the gospel that you are loved, included, accepted, that sin is the condition of humanity. It's never been our, our identity. And Christ is the healer. Amen. Um, our faith, it's a road. It's a journey. It's a path. Life is a journey. And it's filled with ups and downs and roundabouts and highs and lows and valleys and mountaintops. And in all of that, he is Emmanuel, God with us. God with us, Emmanuel. And, um, you know, I've learned that life, you know, like I, I had this idea when I first, you know, started out in ministry and I had this idea that, you know, like I was very caught up with just this idea of the power of God, you know, and it was always, gonna, it's always wow, and it's always like big, and it's always really exciting, and all of those things. And, and this, look, amen, he created this cosmos. It is pretty wow, right? If there was a big bang, like, you know, God spoke and breathed life. You know, scientists call it the Big Bang, but we know it, it, it's God speaking, you know, and creating out of nothing. So he is powerful. But as a, as a you know, as a someone in ministry, I always thought that life was always about these powerful moments, you know, one powerful testimony to the next and one wow encounter with God, you know, in the next. And we want to we want to just experience and encounter that power. And I don't know about you guys, but I found like I discovered that a lot of life is very ordinary, right? And I think that's what happens with people. Sometimes they get stuck on this idea that life has got to be this you know, full on conference. You know, life is like this endless conference. You know, when you go to a conference, it's all the highlights. You know, I've been to Bethel a number of times and it's like, you know, it's pretty wow and pretty impressive, but it's a conference, all right? Life, I don't know about you guys, but I've discovered life is pretty ordinary. At times, it's pretty much like getting in there and just doing stuff day after day, raising our kids, you know, loving our families, working hard, you know, honouring what we do, you know, with our workplaces and things. And life is like that. And I remember I said to um, one of the people who's like a mentor to me, and I said, I was talking to her about the church, you know, this is going back a while, and talking about how, you know, we just felt like we were a little bit on maintenance mode, you know, like in the church. We're not seeing a lot of wow and a woof and whatever. Um, and she just said to me, and it just spoke freedom and life to me, and she said to me, in a family, if you were having parties every day in your family, if every day was like a party, you'd be dysfunctional as a family. And she said, you know, it's okay for a church, a family, to just be doing life, you know. And of course we know that God brings growth and but there's a lot of there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of like these extra things that get laid on us and these ideas that somehow are just a little bit of a distortion on on really on on the on the truth of of things and yes god is into growth and a healthy church looks like a flourishing church and all and a healthy christian looks like a flourishing christian but you know what the truth of the matter is that sometimes life is just boring right? It is. We're doing, we're doing the stuff that is just ordinary life. So I just want to, if, I just want to take that 
let's take that off our thinking that everything always has to be big wow encounters and wow moments and just know that God is with us. He's always present. Amen. So um, something that I would, wish I would have known years ago. But, um, you know, sometimes on this road, it sort of feels like, you know, it's an unsealed road. There's lots of potholes. You know, it's a winding path up, up and downs. And sometimes the road ahead's hard to see. And, you know, sometimes we feel like we might have taken a bit of a detour. You know, we're not on plan A anymore. We've gone to plan B. You know what I mean? Have I missed the plan of God for my life? Have I detoured off the track? Well, I don't believe in that plan A and B anymore. God's with me. And when I go here, he's with me. And when I go here, he's with me. Sure, he's inviting me to journey with him and walk with him. And I do believe that there are specific things and times in our life that we are specifically called, absolutely called for things and two things you know, with purpose. I believe in that. I do believe that. I still believe that. Um, but wherever we go, he's with us. You know, like that idea of a plan A, it's very narrow, right? If you really be honest, it, you know, if there's, you know, the plan of God for your life and it's plan A, it's very narrow and it's very restrictive. And us as humans, we miss things all the time right? There's no way that you or I, if there was plan A, there's no way that you and I are walking on it. Because life, we've done stuff, we've made decisions that have altered our life, the course of our life. We've maybe not heard, we've maybe made, you know, all of those things. But you know what? It's okay. Because God is present. He's not, he hasn't gone anywhere. He's not over there on plan A and I'm over here on plan X. You know what I mean? I've got to do all this stuff now, all jump through all these hoops to get back to plan A. It's not, that's not, just get rid of that, all right? Remember that. Um, following Jesus as the way means in the present is where we find him. He's not off somewhere down the track. He's right here. He's present. And we find him on the way with us. Amen. Amen. And I've discovered, you know, that um, the gospel and, the, and spiritual formation is the lifelong formation of the life of Christ in us. It's lifelong, this journey. You know, Christ is being formed in us. Amen. And, you know, what I've learned is that we need to trust in the slow work of God. Because once upon a time I thought it was... And when that didn't happen, you know, we get discouraged or we feel like whatever. But I've discovered that the work of God, it's a slow work often. Yes, God does quick things at times, like things that are just like at the last minute God comes through, there's a breakthrough. Yes, we've seen plenty of those. But most often in my life, I've been invited to trust in the slow work of God on the inside of me, but also in the world. I believe that God's working in the world. Amen. And yes, it seems like a slow work, but he's working in the world. Um, and when I trust in this, I can be reminded that the grace of God is alive and it's active. Yeah. It's alive and it's active. In Luke 8, 15, it says, but as for that, it's talking about the seed. It says, as for that in the good soil, these are the ones who, when they hear the word, they hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patient endurance. This sounds like, to me, trusting in the slow work of God. Trusting in the slow work of God invites us to live in the grace of the day. Like, I'm always talking about the grace of the day because I believe that there's a grace. Every morning there's new grace. That's why I love the sunrise. That's why I love getting up at that time so I can see, you know, the first light come in and the sunrise. And it gives me, you know, it shows me that there's a grace for today. It's a new day, that today is not a repeat of yesterday, you know. Um, it gives us, yeah, fresh opportunities to be the difference. That's what we're called to be, to be the difference in this world, to be kind, 
and to be compassionate. You know, some of us don't have these great, you know, amazing testimonies all the time of how we can, you know, like talk to people and tell people all these amazing stories about what God's done. Like you hear some people and it's just like, wow. And then there's us, you know, and, and we don't always have those big things to say. But being kind, being compassionate, being loving, extending grace, that's power. And that's what humanity needs, amen? And we get to do that. We get invited to participate in that every single new day. And when we stuff up, if we stuff up the day before, guess what? We wake up and it's the reset button and it's a new day. Amen? And this is what we can give to others. This is the grace that we can extend to others. This is the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus that we are extending to others. Amen? And we can all do it. We've all got that within us. We can all be kind. We can all show love. We can all be gracious. Amen. So some last thoughts on faith and the scriptures. I'm just, I've discovered that there are things that I once believed adamantly that I don't believe now. Um, and in a way, I had to disagree with myself to grow in truth. So I want, I want to invite you, are there things in your life that perhaps you need to disagree with yourself on um, in order to grow, in order to, you know, maybe there's some things, that, you know, that we need to let go. We talked about, we've talked about that surrender. What are some of the things that I might need to surrender, to let go of, in order to live open-hearted and open-handed? Um, Jesus repeated a, fa- a phrase over and over when he was challenging the rigid thinking of his day. And he said, you've heard it said, but I say. And what Jesus was doing, he was introducing ideas that challenge people to discover a new way of thinking, believing and behaving. And that's what he's still at it. He's still inviting us to that. Um, there are, sadly, there are many expressions of the church and Christians that obsess over their interpretation of the scriptures that from their perspective make them more right than others. Jesus said that he was the way, that he was the truth and the life. Truth is found in the person of Jesus. I'm discovering that our faith is not about having all the answers. Guess what? We cannot know all the answers. It's about choosing to trust. Matthew 28, 17. This is after the resurrection and Jesus is revealing himself to the disciples. It says they worshipped him. They worshipped him, but some doubted. So they worshipped him, they were worshipping him, yet in their hearts they still doubted. Jesus built his church on the lives of doubting worshippers and he still continues to do so. Amen. He can handle our doubt. He can handle our uncertainty. It's okay to have doubts. Remember that. Remember that in your next season. It's okay to have doubts. Remember what Shane Willard says that a good sermon is not meant to be agreed with, it's meant to be wrestled with. You do not have to believe everything that comes out of the mouth of someone who stands in the pulpit, okay? You have a mind, you can search the scriptures, okay? Um, And we can wrestle with stuff and it's okay. Amen? Okay, in the past, I pursued a relationship with a distant God. I felt that I, I was seeing God was there. And so I pursued a relationship with a distant God and it looked like, you know, like sin, we were told, had separated us from God and that through a, a series of spiritual disciplines, reading the Bible, praying, that through those disciplines we could have a relationship with that God. And look, there's that, that's true. That is true. We do have a relationship with God, you know, through reading the scriptures, through prayer. But it's not... It's not in doing those things that we get to God. He has not gone anywhere. Amen? It's just a change of thinking because that sort of, that sort of thinking, when we believe we've got to do in order to get God to love us, it leads to performance. 
and we've set free from that rock church. You're set free from that way of thinking that you've got to perform in order to earn God's love. You're loved. You're not separated from God. Amen? Amen. And knowing that should ignite this passion for intimacy with God in our hearts. That's what it does. Knowing that there's no separation ignites us to love. But, you know, even, I want to tell you this, even when you maybe haven't prayed and you haven't read the scriptures and you haven't done, God is still just as present with you. Amen? Yeah. Amen. And he's just inviting you, in, like, inviting you, hey, come lean on me. Come on, let's walk together. Like, and when, we're, uh, when we are aware of that, we participate. We want to participate in that relationship. We don't want to be off to the side, like just our ears blocked, but we want to step in to that flow of that relationship. Amen? Um, yes. So proximity fixes everything. It's knowing in our heart the truth that we were joined with him from our conception, that we've never been separate, that he's been with us in our darkness as well as our mountains. And when our lives contradict who we truly are in Christ, it doesn't take weeks of condemning ourselves and trying to be a good person to get back to his nearness again. Amen. We, let's not approach our lives from a place of separation or lack. Start with, start with inclusion. You are included. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Live by his faith. Amen? It's in him that we live and move and have our being. There is so much life to recover. Our ordinary every days, our eating, our drinking and sleeping are holy and sacred unto the Lord. Amen? Sin is a condition, it's a sickness that needs healing and that Jesus is our loving healer. Let us walk in the light as he is in the light. This means you begin to see your life and everything that concerns you exclusively from the Father's point of view, that you are indeed the focus of your Father's attention and affection. Um, Last thoughts on theology. Jesus Christ is perfect theology. And he reveals to us what God is like. Toxic images, I said this before, abound in the church and with Christians, unfortunately. We see God as the punishing judge, the deadbeat dad, the genie in the bottle. They're all false images of God that need to be challenged. God is truly and completely Christ-like. His love is more generous. The cross is more powerful and his gospel more beautiful than we ever dared to imagine. Our clearest image of God is the self-giving, radically forgiving, co-suffering love revealed on the cross. Hold fast to a Christ-like God. Hold fast to a Christ-like God. God is good. He's much better than we thought. What a joy for me it has been in discovering that the good news has always been better than I ever imagined. You know, um, one of the, one of the, and you can relate to this, I'm sure, one of the things that I used to have some funny ideas about was the anointing, right? The anointing. I needed the anointing to preach well, to counsel, to pray. I had to say some special words to somehow get under the anointing. The idea was that the anointing was something that I lacked. And when I have that understanding and that belief, like when I really examine my beliefs, what, what, what do I believe about the anointing? Um, when I looked at that, it was like, well, it's something that I lack and I need more of. So when I have that understanding, it draws me to some conclusions. I need more anointing. And then that raises questions for me, like, how do I get it? How do I get more? And how do I know when I have it? How do, we, how do I know if I have enough for whatever it is I'm about to do? Like, often, let's be honest, in church, anointing has been measured by goosebumps. Right? goosebumps like especially the worship right if it's anointed oh we get goosebumps and we feel it 
And if it's not anointed, well, we don't feel it. Like a lot of that is personal preference on your style of music. Honestly, being honest. And the thing about worship, and I just, again, I thought it this morning, the thing about worship, like when we have this idea that we're worshiping to get God to come, like he's gone somewhere, so we needed to sing some songs in order to entice him to come. Come, you've gone, come on. And if we sing louder, and if we sing with more anointing, well, God's going to come. It's like, well, where was he? He left the building. So it's like, no, it's not. And the thing about, and I am at the point where, like, I truly believe that God does not have this big ego that needs stroking all the time right? That God needs his ego to be stroked over and over and over and over again through worship. It's like, what does worship do? Worship forms us. Worship realigns us with who God is and who we are. And when we worship, it, it, with our, and we're, we're singing, we're declaring, we're making some adjustments. Like, you know, like at the end, when you've worshipped, when you've sung some songs, like, and, you know, it begins to shift and realign us to the goodness of God. Amen? Yes. It's not like God comes back in. Oh, yeah. Come on. That's good. I can hear that. It's good. And he comes back in. It's like, no, he's present. He's not. Like, he's Emmanuel. Is he Emmanuel? Is he God that is present or is he God that's not present? Like these are the things that I've discovered. Like there can be a lot of confusion with our, our theology. Our theology is our thoughts about God. There can be a lot of confusion that God's in, he's out, he's in, he's out, he's in, he's out. And it leads to this performance. So I just want us to remember that God is Emmanuel. He said it. He said it. He said, I am Emmanuel, I am present. I'm the God that is present. Amen. So worship, even though I love it, I love to participate. And there there is this idea of offering up to the Lord. There is that, that beautiful sense of giving up to God what is his. And there is that, but but worship also forms us. Okay? It's a partnership together, like it's God singing over us. Like I've had times when I thought, man, I am really get, becoming a heretic. Because there's times in worship when I felt the Lord say, you know, like he's singing that over me. You know what I mean? Like he's singing those words over me. And so it's this beautiful partnership and worship aligns us with the heart of the Father and it reveals his identity and ours. So amen. Amen to that. Remember that. The scriptures, there's lots of things I could say about the scriptures, but I'm going to bring this all to a close. And we do have communion, so if those could kindly distribute those. Um, the thing about the anointing is that we, we, don't, we, we can treat the anointing like a commodity. And this idea that some people um, carry this commodity and that they use it to minister... Um, it's that idea of come get the anointing from me. You know, sometimes that's the messaging in the, in the prayer, in the altar. Like come get the message, uh, come get the anointing from me and take it home with you. Um, but my last thoughts on the anointing is that the anointing is a living person. His name is Jesus Christ. And he has poured out his spirit and his spirit lives within us. It's living water. Amen. And the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is to teach and guide us into the truth of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's in 1 John 2, 18 and 19. My very last thoughts on the Bible. Lots of our problems with the Bible come from only reading the text literally. For example, I'll quickly go through these. Mark 9, 45, it says, if your foot causes you to slip, cut it off. It's better for you to go into life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into Gehenna. Mark 9, 47, it says, if your eye causes you to slip up, throw it away. It's better for you to go into the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two two eyes and to whatever. Luke 14, 26, if any of you come to me and don't hate your father and your mother, your wife and your children, your brothers and your sisters, yes, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. 
Matthew 8, 21, 22. Master, said another of his disciples, let me first go to see my father's funeral. Follow me, replied Jesus, and leave the dead to bury their own dead. If taken literally, Jesus seems to be promoting self-harm, family dysfunction, and a lack of empathy. But we know... But we know that isn't the nature of the Jesus who loves us and gave himself up for us. So when reading the scriptures, when reading the Bible, we need to ask ourselves, what was Jesus trying to communicate? Remembering that the Bible is an ancient book written by ancient people in an ancient context. But hallelujah, the Bible is alive and it's active and it takes us on a journey and it's flowing and going somewhere and it's leading us to Jesus. All scripture must bow the knee to Jesus. All scripture. So that when we read the hard things that don't sound like Jesus and there's so much of that in the Bible, we need to ask ourselves what else might be going on here in this passage of scripture that I'm reading. In this story, what else might be going on here? How does this passage point to Christ? How does this passage form us to become more like Christ? The Word of God, we talk about the Bible being the Word of God, but the Word of God is a person. Jesus Christ, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's in John, John 1. We're not talking about the Bible. In the beginning was not God the Father, Son, and the Holy Bible. It wasn't. It was Jesus the living word. And what God has done is he's allowed humanity to try and tell the story. And so people have ex- encountered and experienced God and, and someone thought we better start writing this down. But guess what? The Bible wasn't written in English. It was written in ancient languages. So we're reading, when we read the scriptures in English, And we're reading with our, is it the 21st century? Reading with the 21st century mindset. We've got to remember what else might be going on there. You know, Jesus in, sorry, in Revelation 9.13, it says that Jesus, his name is called the word of God. Jesus regarded all scripture as being fulfilled in himself. The final word of God who reveals the true nature of the Father, that's Jesus. Hebrews 1, 1 to 2 says, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. The Bible is the grand narrative of redemption told through a multitude of voices and worldviews, all coming to the conclusion conclusion in the arrival of Christ as the eternal word of God. In other words, Christ is what God has to say about himself. Can you stand with me? My last thoughts on communion. I'll probably have more thoughts but these might be the last ones that anyone listens to. (laughs) Um, So, you know, communion, there's a lot about communion. Um, But I just, I'm seeing this as, you know, communion is coming to the table. It's not not as a reward for having your life in order. You know, some people have got some funny ideas about, oh, I can't take communion because I'm not right. Or, you know, like I've got sin in my life. and But, you know, communion isn't about having your life in order. It's not a reward. Um, like, let's not forget the folk that gathered around the table with Jesus. Participating in the first communion did not have their lives together. Whatever way you look at it, those first disciples did not have their lives together. You know, Jesus said, do this. Like, partake in these emblems, like the juice and the bread, the biscuit, that, that remind us of his body and his blood. And he said, take them in remembrance of me. And it's a surrender. Like, communion is about surrendering. Surrendering to God frees us from the burden of self-reliance. 
You know, we don't need to rely upon ourselves. We can surrender. And in surrendering, we open ourselves up to his guidance and his wisdom. Communi- uh, communion communicates inclusion and participation. Participating in what God is doing, what he has done and what he will do. And remembering So true knowing is relational knowing. So like knowing, knowing him, knowing that he's with you, he's present. So why don't we take communion today and, yeah, do it knowing that you're included. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. So, there's some of my last thoughts. Um, look, you know, you may not agree with some of the things that I presented today. That's okay, because it's good to wrestle with some of this stuff, right? I just pray from here, people. Whatever your next season is going to look like, I pray that you will remember that you will remember the goodness of God, that you'll remember you're included, that you're not separated. I pray that you remember that you don't have to perform to earn the Father's love, that you are loved and included, accepted, beloved. He calls you beloved. Amen. I want to thank you. I'm sure, you know, next week's our last Sunday, so um, I'll be trying. Well, you know, that's going to be a beautiful, hopefully, beautiful morning. Um, where we just celebrate. And uh, look, it's, a bit, it's change. It's change all, for all of us, right? Big changes that maybe most of us didn't expect. But, you know, change, in every change is a new opportunity. There's an opportunity for a new beginning. So whatever that's going to look like for all, each and every one of us, we know that Emmanuel, God is with us. And we've had a great journey. Amen. We've done some amazing things here yeah. in our community and in this place. And have, we've had lots of, you know, lots of incredible times and seasons. We've had challenging seasons. We've had seasons where we didn't agree on stuff. But we've just journeyed together as family. And, um, yeah, so I just really want to thank you. I want to thank you for, yeah, just allowing me to journey with you. Um, and for listening to me <laughs> when I've stood up here and, the, and that you guys have been gracious um, in probably seeing me, my growth as well, my change um, so that's taken part before, before you, really. So thank you and amen. And thank you, Lord. Amen. <laughs> okay. Wow. Thank you, Pastor Helen. Wow. You left the best to last. (laughs) That was so good. (laughs) feel like we got a smorgasbord this morning.